Superhero shows have taken on a variety of genres over the years. Action, fantasy, sci-fi, drama, comedy. But what if I told you there was a show that tackled all of those genres and set the bar while it was at it? Well, I don't know. That sounds pretty interesting. And it's a Green Lantern show. Oh, get over it. It was just one movie. I mean, some bad ideas get six seasons. But in all seriousness, just because Green Lantern had one bad live action outing doesn't mean the IP deserves all the hate it gets. Especially in light of Green Lantern the Animated Series. And I wasn't joking when I said it tackles multiple genres simultaneously and succeeds. But in order to understand how it does this, we need to go back to the beginning. Green Lantern the Animated Series first aired in November of 2011 to, uh capitalize on the Green Lantern movie? Well, that kind of thing isn't out of the ordinary. Most animated superhero shows are usually created to capitalize on a movie. Avengers Assemble, X-Men Evolution, and even Batman the Animated Series were all created in response to the profit of movies that preceded them. And speaking of Batman the Animated Series, its producer and one of the DCAU's architects, Bruce Timm, was brought on to helm Green Lantern the Animated Series, along with first-time showrunner Giancarlo Volpe, who had previously worked as a director on Avatar are the Last Airbender and Clone Wars. This made sense, especially considering Bruce Timm and Paul Dini's success with the 14 year spanning DC animated universe. This would also mark the first time that Bruce Timm worked on a project with CG, and thankfully, they were able to translate the classic DCAU art style into 3D. And speaking of art style... Remember how I said the 3D animation of Iron Man Armored Adventures was good? Well, this show takes it to a whole new level. Any negative that was present in Iron Man Armored Adventures is not even remotely present here. In terms of animation quality, Green Lantern the Animated Series is on par with the very best of Clone Wars. All the principles of animation are constantly on display here, which is impressive considering how stiff 3D can be as a medium. The character animation has so much personality. All one has to do is look at Kilowog's walk cycle, and you'll see how much character was put into making these characters come alive, something that has somewhat been lost in recent superhero cartoons. One of my friends put it this way, it's one thing to make a character function, it's another to give them life and personality. Small things like breathing, blinking, and especially how a character shifts their own weight contribute so much to making a character feel like they're alive. And speaking of weight, this show also had fantastic anticipation of action and follow through of action. The use of these principles make the characters feel like they genuinely have weight, and thankfully for the sake of the animation team, the character designers made the art sleek and minimalist, which allowed the animation team to not have to focus on secondary animation, and more so on blocking out and refining the base animation. Although even when there is secondary animation, it is still just as stunning. Like I mentioned before, the character designs were heavily inspired by Bruce Timm's previous superhero works. They even reused Kilowog's design from this show in the recent Justice League vs. Fatal 5 movie, which makes sense considering the majority of the show episodes and Justice League vs. The Fatal Five were directed by Sam Liu. But what really made this show stand out from others was how unique and cool the designs were in relation to how much ground the show covered. Alien environments, alien species, alien cultures, all of these things created this living, breathing universe that made it stand out from any other superhero show. I mean, the show only has three episodes that take place on Earth. That was how committed the showrunners were to showing their audience something they'd never seen before. But the coolest part about the character designs in particular was how unique each of the characters' clothes were. Now, that might sound a little strange or arbitrary, but let me explain. In the comics and even the movie, all the lanterns pretty much wear the same uniform, and for a universal police force, this makes sense. But at the same time, these are aliens from different cultures that have different preferences. Hal Jordan's suit is pretty close to the basic superhero design considering his cocky nature. Kilowogs is more armored and even has the tiny detail of an embossed lantern logo, considering he's a hardcore drill sergeant. And Razor's suit is, well, I mean, come on. With a name like that, you'd expect him to be a little edgy. Even the types of constructs each character uses are indicative of their personality. Hal Jordan's a baseball fan, Kilowog's a heavy hitter and uses a hammer, and Razor... 
you can probably guess. But this show constantly blows my mind with how many unique objects they make for each episode. Trust me, creating 3D models, at least to me, ain't a picnic. Even the texturing is fantastic. And considering this is a show about characters that can create anything they can imagine, that's intimidating as an artist, but also freeing as it allows the show to do almost anything with the story. Despite the many 3D objects they had to make, they were also smart with planning their backgrounds, often using matte paintings that blended seamlessly into the 3D environment. This really displayed how much inspiration they took from the great sci-fi and fantasy that preceded them. And the art style wasn't the only thing of great quality, unlike my segues. Let's talk about... Okay, let me level with you for a sec. This is honestly one of the greatest shows I've ever watched. The characters, the world building, and overarching events all come together in a beautifully crafted story. Which makes sense. The story is heavily inspired by Jeff Johns' 10 year run of writing Green Lantern, which is most famous for bringing other Lantern cores into the mythos. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the general concept of Green Lantern, here's a quick summary. Green Lanterns are an intergalactic peacekeeping force that are inducted into the core from all over the galaxy and are chosen based upon the strength of their willpower. But thankfully, this show doesn't feel the need to do a whole origin story. Their assumption was that everybody had seen the movie, so they already had a general idea of how this universe works. But even if you haven't seen the movie or aren't familiar with Green Lantern at all, everything is easily explained to the audience by good character dialogue and what is literally shown on screen. So there's really not any need for ham-fisted exposition. Our story follows Hal Jordan, Green Lantern of Earth. This gives us a human character to connect to, while the show explores the alien goings on of the galaxy. And like I said, the movie had just come out, so the writers didn't feel the need to retell Hal Jordan's origin story. This also means that the majority of the show doesn't take place on Earth, because why would you take a cosmic superhero and have all their adventures take place on Earth? I mean, the only way you could make it even more disappointing would be to make the setting the desert, the most boring environment imaginable. This would be incredibly boring and stupid and make you regret buying a ticket and sorry I lost my train of thought, what were we talking about? The point is, Green Lantern the Animated series doesn't waste your time and immediately jumps into expanding the universe. They do this by introducing the Red Lanterns, an evil core that is intent on killing any Green Lantern they come across, and eventually destroying the core as a whole. And yes, you heard me right, kill. This show did not shy away from the horrors of war. As a result of rings from dead lanterns showing up on the Green Lantern homeworld, Green Lanterns Hal Jordan and Kilowog steal an experimental ship and embark on a mission to discover the reason as to why so many lanterns have been dying at the far reaches of the galaxy. Along the way, the group is eventually joined by Razor, a turncoat Red Lantern that disagrees with the extreme methods of the Red Lantern Corps, and Aya, the AI of the Lantern ship given robotic form. But like I mentioned earlier, everything in this show is connected. The Red Lanterns aren't just one-dimensional bad guys. As it turns out, they are the survivors of a sector that was destroyed by the peacekeeping force that preceded the Green Lanterns. These Manhunters, as they're called, were created by the Guardians of the Universe, and that's why the Red Lanterns are out to destroy them along with their current police force, the Green Lantern Corps. For those of you who are familiar with Sentinels from X-Men, the Manhunters are basically that. Except instead of being relegated to one planet, the Manhunters are an army patrolling the entire universe that wants to exterminate all emotional life. This backstory gives genuine emotional stakes to the events of the show, as well as humanizing the Red Lanterns and the high and mighty guardians of the universe. This is what made the story so engaging, because it tackled character building themes, like the idea of what makes us human, or the validity, purpose, and even complexity of emotions. Which brings us to... With many of the characters' main character trait being strong willpower, you'd expect them to be pretty similar. In reality, though, these characters couldn't be more personally diverse. Hal Jordan, played by Josh Keaton, aka the best Spider-Man, is very Han Solo-esque in terms of his personality. He's cocky, charismatic, but less arrogant than Han Solo. Hey, I, I said less arrogance. He's not entirely devoid of it. But you'd expect him to not work well with others. But as a result of being around younger and inexperienced characters, his confidence makes him a great leader and even mentor. Despite his confidence, he isn't without his flaws. He's very used to breaking the rules, so when he's challenged by others and unable to do anything about it, his passion can overtake his better judgment. You punched him in the face. Is this true? Uh, no, sir. I punched the Viceroy in the stomach. Then I headbutted him in the face. Sir. 
but thankfully he's partnered up with Kilowog, voiced by one of my personal favorite voice actors, Kevin Michael Richardson. Kilowog is a no-nonsense drill sergeant, gruff and rigid as they come, but not without his soft spots. I'm happy here, molding, guiding, and nurturing young recruits so they realize their potential. The way, they're like my children. You useless, stumbling piece of stinking oonsplat! Do it again! This is what makes Hal and himself the perfect duo, as they play off each other's strengths, but can help each other grow past their weaknesses. Not to mention these characters play off each other extremely well comedically. There. Right there. Right where? I am not crazy. I saw something there. It's hard to pick a favorite character in this show, considering how each of them are very, very good, but I've always had a soft spot for big, strong characters with hearts of gold, so gold star for you, buddy. But this brings us to the most interesting of the main characters, Razor and Aya. Both of them are original characters created specifically for this show, but sadly haven't appeared outside of it. Razor, voiced by Jason Spizak, is a repentant Red Lantern that joined the Evil Corps after losing his lover during a war, and his subsequent rage made him perfect for Atrocitus of the Red Lanterns to manipulate into joining his cause. But after Razor sees the injustices the Red Lanterns are committing, he joins the main crew and slowly befriends them. Come on, shake hands. Not like that. Razor is probably the best character in the entire show for a couple reasons. He has a redeeming story arc that even though he would rather die as punishment for his evil actions, he eventually commits to doing the right thing to make up for it. He's also a tragic but endearing character, as rage is his most defining quality, which can lead to him being sarcastic at usually Kilowog's expense, or him taking things over seriously and not understanding when people are messing with him. I despise that you have a point. He also gets the most character development, starting out, like I said, an extremely angry character, and even one that doesn't want to take responsibility, to becoming compassionate, loving, and eventually hopeful. It's not a complete personality turnaround, but rather the motivation for his actions is what changes. And speaking of the motivation for his actions, let's talk about the final member of the crew, Aya. As stated earlier, Aya is the AI of the Green Lantern ship that takes on a robotic form. And naturally, she looks like this because... Bruce Tim. She's also played by the emotionally ranged Grey Delisle. And despite being a robot, Aya is very human in her actions. You do not kill. Your programming has been corrupted. It is not programming that keeps me from killing. It is a decision I made after observing the Green Lanterns I work with. She's curious and wants to learn about the world and is very observant of the emotions of others, especially the extremely emotional Razor. This is genuinely a very interesting take on the classic robot learns to become human archetype, as it's in a setting with characters that the trope isn't usually around. The show is literally about emotions, putting her development front and center. She wants to learn about emotions and learns to care for people, but still doesn't understand why she feels pain as a result of this. The moment replays in my memory banks on an endless loop. I believe it is causing me what you would call pain. I do not want to feel this. Her and Razor become very close to the point of romance, and uh, well, it goes about as well as you can expect. Human dating. It's enjoyable, and it serves an important purpose. But when a human dates an artificial mate, there is no purpose. Only enjoyment. And that leads to tragedy. But in all seriousness, the characters do learn and grow to become a tight-knit group. Heck, entire episodes are dedicated to this development. But thankfully, these kinds of episodes don't sacrifice world-building or logic to tell an emotional story. For example, in one episode, the charge from the Rings of the Lanterns runs out and they lose their powers, as well as their universal translators. This forces the group to work together even without speaking the same language. It's a really interesting idea to see how people who once understood one another verbally can still work together even with the barrier of language. And like I said before, the show uses rules established in the universe to build both the characters and the world at the same time. This is what makes this show stand out, especially from recent media. It is written logically so they can have an emotional payoff. But we've talked enough about the emotional side of things. Let's talk about... Okay, so I may have lied a little. The world building is incredibly emotional, just not in the same way as character development. That might sound confusing, but let me explain. Green Lanterns are powered by Will, and the Red Lanterns are powered by Rage. If two Lantern Cores could tap into and use emotion to power themselves, who's to say other emotions can't be used? We meet Violet, Orange, and the best Lantern Core, Blue Lanterns. Each of them are powered by love, greed, 
and hope respectively. We're introduced to these concepts over time. Each time, the characters have a specific motivation that leads to them encountering this new Lantern Corps. They are never arbitrary, nor do they feel like they come out of nowhere. Each of them have their own culture and motivations which make them unite or clash with our heroes depending on the situation. It makes everything feel connected, like it's a living, breathing world. For example, the Violet Lanterns, or Star Sapphires, are actually guardians of the universe that disagreed with their brethren, and the Blue Lanterns are formed by other guardians that wanted to create another core to support the Green Lanterns. Every single thing in this show is connected, and it's world building and character writing and shows like this that make me wish modern media put more thought and care into the products that they create. Not to mention, we eventually got to see fan favorite characters like Guy Gardner, Sinestro, and even the Anti-Monitor. Hilariously enough, Guy Gardner is voiced by Diedrich Bader, who voiced Batman in Batman Brave and the Bold, and uh, who did this to the Guy Gardner of that show. You so much as sneeze without my permission, you're going to regret it. That I'd like to see! He's kind of like if Hal Jordan was exclusively cocky and had no one to rein him in like Kilowog. He even makes a reference to the best Green Lantern, Jon Stewart. And if you're in the Honor Guard now, who's the new Lantern for our sector? I don't know, some other Earth guy. What's his name? Jon Stewart. The fake news guy. We also get to see Sinestro in this show. For those of you who are at least somewhat familiar with Green Lantern, you might be surprised to know he only shows up in one episode, considering he's the Green Lantern bad guy. You'd think him and the Yellow Lanterns would be more prominent. Apparently, WB specifically requested Sinestro and his core not appear in the show, but eventually he did. And he was voiced by friggin' Ron Perlman, which, in all honesty, I think that's a pretty good casting for his character, especially in the voice side of things. This take on his character was super interesting. How idolizes him as a fellow rebel against the Guardians, which could have been interesting to see if Hal would eventually become evil like his idol had the show continued. And lastly, we have the Anti-Monitor, who finally got the spotlight shown on him outside of the comics. It's really strange how obscure of a character he is, considering he's basically Galactus on a multiversal scale. I mean, he's even responsible for rebooting the DC Universe back in Crisis on Infinite Earths. you think they would do more with him considering he's such an important character. Oh, but he was the bad guy and the CW Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah, well, they do a lot of stuff at the CW. Although his origin has changed, he is still the ultimate bad guy. Pretty much any confrontation with this character boils down to- Run away! But even if the Anti-Monitor wasn't threatening in this show, just about anything would be better than whatever the CW tried to build up. Who am I? I am the Anti-Monitor. Acting! <laughs> Green Lantern the Animated Series is a tragic show in many ways. While many blame the live-action film for the show's failure, the sad fact is Warner Brothers and Cartoon Network were planning to pull the plug no matter what. Because apparently they thought kids didn't like serious stories and replaced it along with all DC cartoons with the show that shall not be named. Considering the amount of character development and world building it achieved in just 26 episodes, that is truly a shame. And the fact that it ends on a cliffhanger teasing future events certainly doesn't help. It's really unlike any other superhero story I've ever seen. Green Lantern has some of the most untapped potential of any fictional property. From the very beginning, the show was in danger of cancellation, which shows how much heart and passion the entire team put in to make it as good as possible for however long it would last. Bruce Timm even referred to the show as the best thing he ever worked on that no one watched. If there's one show I would like to see renewed, it would probably be this one, preferably with its original team as well. But for those of you who have haven't watched Green Lantern the Animated Series, they recently added it to HBO Max, along with many other great DC cartoons. So even if this one doesn't pique your interest, there are plenty of other good ones that I should probably make videos on someday. But what do you guys think? Let me know what you think in the comments section below. This has been Bovine Designs, and I'll catch you guys next time for more comic book talk, animations, and reviews. Y'all have a good one.